Is it recording? Hi guys, can everybody hear me? Okay, this isn't the beginning of the speech. I'm just going to give you um, a brief introduction before I start. So uh, this speech was not written by me. It's a speech by uh, one of the interpreter trainers at Salamanca University who's now retired. He gave this presentation actually. Um, at the 15th uh, DG Interpretation Conference a few years ago. It's a speech on the history of interpreting. There are three, no, not even, there are like two terms in it. So the first, and the first one is a name, it's La Malinche, who was uh, one of the native interpreters who worked with, uh, with uh, Cortés and um, the other Spaniards and, or, you know, of debatable nationality who had arrived. And uh, the second one is just ILO, the International Labour Organization. So, nothing too difficult. Okay. I'm going to get started now. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you all. Tonight we've heard speeches on a range of topics, uh, as always. But I'd like to bring things back to uh, something that concerns us all, which is, of course, interpreting, which is uh, our profession. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of interpreting, interpreting in the 20th century and the future of interpreting as well. So uh, since interpreting began, which some could argue was you know, several millennia ago, um, it can be argued that interpreters served as a critical link between languages and cultures. For example, uh, in 1492, that fateful date, Columbus took an interpreter with him uh, on his journey to the Indies, and things uh, only progressed from there. We have other notable examples of interpreters throughout history, like La Malinche, and please note that in modern day Spanish, uh, Malinche is a traitor, which just goes to show uh, how much interpreters can be perceived as being faithful to not one si neither side of the story. Now, interpreting continued throughout history. Um, I'm going to skip to the 20th century, since that's really when um, the first steps in simultaneous interpreting were taken. Now, it's often said, and I'm sure you will all have heard, that simultaneous interpreting was born after the Second World War at the UN, at the Nuremberg Trials. It's not true. <laughs> Actually, uh, in the history of simultaneous interpreting dates back further than that uh, to the 1920s. 1928 at an ILO conference, the International Labour Organization. So how it worked originally, you may have seen some pictures, was that interpreters sat in quite basic booths with um, a high quality microphone and they also had headsets. And in the beginning, um, the listeners did not wear headsets the interpreting was broadcast into the room via a loudspeaker, so you can imagine what that must have been like. And simultaneous interpreting, of course, um, continued to progress as people realized that it was a time saver and as, moreover, people realized that it was a viable solution in terms of uh, delivering speeches in a multilingual fashion. So I'm going to move on now to... Uh, the Nuremberg Trials and the next steps in conference interpreting. This is when the first uh, classes on interpreting began to be given. Uh, there is a letter from a translator who said he wanted to improve his simultaneous interpreting skills. And so in the beginning, as with all uh, budding professions, there wasn't really any kind of system in place to regulate the profession and regulate who could be a part of it. Okay. 
So that's just to give you a brief outline. I did say the speech was going to be very brief. That's just to give you a brief outline of how things came about. But what's interesting when we look at the history of interpreting is to see that um, we have all these anecdotal incidents leading up to the birth of simultaneous interpreting. And then that was even before the history of interpreting began to be written in a formal way. We now have a few ideas that have been enshrined as being the true birth, the true history of interpreting. But what's so interesting often are the stories behind that. Now, moving on to the future of the profession, which of course concerns us all. Uh, remote interpreting is of course the buzzword. Uh, we've all heard of remote interpreting. We've all feared the day when we would have to do remote interpreting. But it's looking uh, more and more like this is the direction the profession is going to go in. So the big question for us is how do we unionize? How can we get organized to ensure that standards are met and that our rights as interpreters are protected when we're on the job and when we're off it? I'll leave it here for today. Thanks very much for listening and I'll see you all soon. Bye now.